So in today's video, we're going to look at part six of a multi-part series on acid bases. Today, we're going to focus in particular on buffers. And today, you'll be able to understand what a buffer is, kind of how it works. I want you to be able to know how to make a buffer. And then we're going to look at actually solving some buffer problems. So let's start with a buffer just by definition. Basically, it's a solution that can be treated with an acid or base and still maintain a relatively constant pH. So for, by comparison, I have pure water on the left at pH 7. And on the right, I've built a pH 7 buffer that is 1 molar hypochlorous acid and 0.3 molar sodium hypochlorite. So just to understand how this works, if you were to um, treat the water with 5 mils of 0.1 molar HCl, the resulting pH would shift all the way down to 1.7. And if you treated that same water with a 5 mils of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide, the pH would raise all the way to 12.3. In comparison, a very similar volume of the buffer. Um, if you treated it with 5 mils of 0.1 molar HCl, it would only, only lower the pH to 6.9. And if you treated the same volume of pH 7 buffer, with 5 mils of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide, it would only raise the pH uh, insignificantly slightly above 7. So that's what a buffer is at its core. It's something that maintains a pH even when it's um, treated with either an acid or a base. So how do you get to that buffer? If you wanted to make a, a buffer acidic, the key to it is you start with the weak acid and to it you add its conjugate base. So the key to that is if you want the bu buffer to be acidic, you have to start with uh, a, a conjugate acid-base pair with the equilibrium favoring the weak acid. In comparison, if you wanted to make a, a basic buffer, you would do the opposite, where you choose a weak base, and then you add its conjugate um, acid. So in this case, I, I could start with ammonia, and the conjugate acid would be some sort of ammonium chloride. The chloride is insignificant, it's a spectator item, ion. So, but once again, the key is the con of the conjugate acid-base pair, the base has a stronger equilibrium, and therefore that's going to make a, a, a basic buffer. So how does a buffer work? So let's, let's look at uh, an acetic acid buffer to which acetate has been added. And once again, the fact that I use sodium acetate or potassium acetate or lithium acetate really doesn't matter. Probably choose a cation from the group one so it's a neutral salt. What you do is you add not just the weak acid, as I have dr drawn here, okay, but you also add the conjugate base. So you, would, like I said, you add acetate in the form of sodium or potassium acetate. And for this diagram, I've removed the uh, cations just to provide a little bit of clarity. So if you looked at this scenario, the way it starts, the original pH of this solution, which is a mixture of a sodium acetate and acetic acid, um, the pH is really determined by the weak acid, which is the stronger equilibrium. So just to demonstrate there's very little of that, because it is a weak acid, very little disassociation. So you'd have a, a fairly high pH. I've got 6.5 in this case when you're adding base to it, let's see how it interacts in such a way that you maintain the pH. Well, when the base, the hydroxide, comes in, it actually uh, deprotonates one of the acetic acids, but it frees up more acetate anion. So I really haven't freed up any protons, so therefore the pH isn't significantly changing. And you can see this going on, and it'll go on as long as there is capacity for that to go on, i.e. as long as there are moles of weak acid available, it'll continue to act this way with the uh, attacking base. And so the pH changes very little. The acid, on the other hand, is neutralized by the A-. In other words, the acid is neutralized by the conjugate base. So if I was now to try and attack this buffer system with some acid, it's going to go find a, a conjugate base and it's going to interact and become the weak acid, which doesn't want to disassociate, so consequently there's a very little change of pH again. 
So I just add a few equivalents of acid and you can see the pH was 6.6 .6, and after it readjusted, it'll go down because we're making it slightly more acidic, but not large jumps. The last part of it is to understand a buffer, you need to know that a buffer does have a capacity, as you can see from the diagram. So for example, so if I was to continue to treat it with acid, you, at some point it would reach capacity where all of the acetates would be occupied. So I'm going to actually go ahead and do that in here and go ahead and, and, and reach the capacity of this buffer. And as, and as it happens, you can see the pH might be changing, if anything, becoming slightly more acidic, right? But not significant. But at some point, uh, the, the acetate will be totally consumed, and then, then the next addition of acid significantly changes the pH because it has no acetate weak base to interact with. And so consequently, with every addition of acid, there's a significant jump in the pH. And that's kind of your clue that you've basically reached or went beyond the capacity of the buffer. To get into the specifics of the buffer, um, we usually use the henderson hasselbalch equation. And we've talked about that in prior videos to understand it. But if you'll look at the, the layout, it basically says if you know the pKa of the conjugate acid, you add the log of the quantity conjugate base divided by the acid that's the weak acid that's present. So this is the conjugate base divided by the conjugate acid. That uh, ratio, take the log of it, add it to the pKa, that'll be your resulting pH. So it's nice to study this because it helps you understand how to make buffers and the capacity of the buffer. So let me just point out a few things. First off, the pKa of the weak acid needs to be very close to the target pH you're seeking. So if you're wanting to get to a pH of uh, 3.5, it's wise to choose a weak acid that has a pKa very close to 3.5. But then when you look at the, the concentration of the weak acid, which goes on the bottom on the denominator, that really tells you the buffering capacity to uh, interact with incoming base. And that makes sense. As the base is coming in, it is actually the weak acid that's interacting with the base, as I show you in the diagram. On the other hand, when you start interacting with acid, it's actually the conjugate base that interacts with the acid. So whenever you look at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, this uh, concentration up here gives you the capacity uh, for interacting with acid. As you see here, it's the weak base that interacts with the incoming acid. So just looking at that um, buffering capacity, that really helps you understand really how to build a buffer. Once again, select the conjugate acid-base pair based on the target pH. If you're not close, you're going to end up being low on capacity. And you can think about that mathematically. If this number is not close to this number, then there's going to have to be a large difference in these two in order to move it. And consequently, um, you're going to have one component uh, with a low capacity. Just for example, if I wanted to move one full pH unit, in other words, I chose a pKa that's at least one pH unit below that. Then in order to move it one pH uh, unit, you can see the comparison of the conjugate base to the acid has to be a ratio of a tenth. So it's got to be ten times different in concentration. Well, if I was to use these actual numbers in here, that would mean that I've got a one molar capacity on the acid end of things to, to combat bases but I only have a tenth of a molar um, conjugate base concentration to combat incoming acid. So consequently, uh, I had to give up some capacity if I want to move that pKa largely. And so that leaves you with a good rule of thumb, and that is you know, the pKa should be within at least one pH unit of the pH target. Step two, when you go to build the buffer, you need to jump in somewhere 
I suggest that you start with the denominator. Now this is not a fixed rule and, and I've started that to bring that out, but basically um, usually it's it's easy enough to make the acid and then and add the conjugate base. And the logic behind that is a lot of times your acid is um, already in solution. Um, so it's 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 easy to just dilute that and come to a final volume that you're trying to target. Um, but the conjugate base of that acid is usually a salt form, so you can literally add it as a, a powdered salt and change the volume very little. So you'll kind of see that as we start to work these problems. But that is not fixed, it's just you're going to have to work with the convenience of the actual materials that you have at hand. The last step is, you know, you choose your acid system, you pre-make your acid to the right of buffering capacity, and then then you solve according to your target pH for the concentration of resulting conjugate base. Advice that we usually give though in, in actual lab practices, this is a pre-calculation. It's a theoretical amount of conjugate base to add so you at least know the ballpark. But um, in practice what you do is you, you prepare the acid solution, you drop a pH meter in there, and then you bring that conjugate base in as a powder to pH and you won't have much change in volume, but your buffer will be spot on because you've uh, dialed it in with a pH meter. So I'm gonna show you a little simulation of that as we try and solve one of these problems. So how do you build a, a pH 6.5 buffer? You wanna make 250 mils of it, and you need a capacity of about half molar. So I, I'm, I'm gonna have in my arsenal 250 mils of half molar to uh, interact with acid and base, right in that range. So first off we go to this acid disassociation table and a lot of times you'll find them where they're written with Ka's and Pk's both and these are the most useful tables to use but uh, I know you might have a book that just has a Ka and in that case you'll you'll use skills you've used in the that I taught you in the last videos to convert Ka to Pka by taking the minus log of the Ka. But anyway my target 6.5, so I start scanning here for things that could reach 6.5. Carbonic acid is an option. It's within one pH unit. And just so you understand, the conjugate acid base pair that we're talking about, because there's a couple in here, right? This is a diprotic acid. So I have either carbonic acid going to bi bicarbonate, or I have bicarbonate going on to carbonate. And so that's what the uh, pKa1 and pKa2 represent in here. But if I was using the bicarbonate going on to carbonate, that would be useful only at a pKa or a pH of around 10.3. I'm using the K1 in this case. So it is actually the carbonic acid with the bicarbonate. But bicarbonate, the negative anion, doesn't exist alone floating around. It has to have a counter ion to stabilize it. So once again, we choose something that would logically be a neutral once you put it in the solution. So sodium, potassium, lithium, whatever you need to use there. Another option that's within one pH unit is using arsenic acid. And in this case, it's not the actual arsenic acid to, to sodium hydrogen arsenate. You'd actually need to use the second disassociation constant. So you're actually starting with a, hydro, a dihydrogen um, arsenate and you're deprotonating one time to get to the uh, hydrogen arsenate and um, that particular combination would require that you have a counter ion of one sodium with the uh, dihydrogen arsenate and two sodiums with the hydrogen arsenate so this is very much an option and finally I've got a, a number down here of 6.49 um, that would work with chromic acid. But once again, it's not the first deprotonation. It's um, going from HCRO4 to CRO4 to the chromate ion. Sodium hydrogen chromate and the sodium chromate uh, in, in solution. I'm going to use the arsenic acid. And uh, when I looked online, I just go to a chemical uh, supplier like uh, Sigmal Bridge or uh, Fisher Scientific, and I find that actually it's easier to get a hold of potassium uh, dihydrogen arsenate, and then uh, it's then you can get disodium hydrogen arsenate, 
And um, the numbers off that table we looked at were PK2 of 6.7. The reference is always the henderson hasselbalch equation. I'm trying to make it where it has a capacity of half a molar. So if I was to take this material at half a molar, and when I looked online, it does come in the solid form. So that's kind of handy, which is true of most of these salts. So that's, I'm, I'm going to make a 0.250 liters. I do a little dimensional analysis uh, by the definition of what uh, molarity means. It's half a mole per liter times the molecular weight of this uh, compound. And I get 22.5 grams of this that I need to add to make a 250 mil solution at half molar. So I literally take that solid, weigh it, put it in a, a volumetric flask, dissolve up to the uh, 250 mil mark. So now I've made my half molar solution. Now the next step is, okay, how much conjugate base do I add? So <clears throat> I'm going to actually just take this freshly made solution, dump it in my beaker where I'm going to actually do my uh, final um, mixture or make the buffer. But just a reminder, you know, this is a weak acid by itself now in water. And if I, you know, did my um, weak acid calculations, it would come out at pH 3.53. Um, now what I want to do is figure out how much um, disodium hydrogen arsenate I want to add. And the way to do that is let's plug the things we know already back into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and, and solve for the conjugate base concentration. And if I solve, I end up with 0.275 molar um, disodium hydrogen arsenate. So I have uh, 250 mils or a quarter of a liter. I basically uh, multiply that according to the uh, concentration I just figured out over here. Um, in the prior step, times the molecular weight of this uh, disodium hydrogen arsenate, and consequently I get 12.8 uh, grams that need to be added. And so once again, this is a solid, and the nice thing is as I add this solid, I'm going to change the volume, but it's, it's fairly insignificant, and that's why it's nice to do this base addition next. But once again, that's how much I'm going to theoretically add, but the way I'm going to add it exactly is I'm going to use my pH meter as the guide. So I start to add this stuff. It obviously will um, change the pH as it goes in and start to approach my target 6.5. Add a little bit more. S um, stir, you know, get it in there, check the new pH. All right, so I'm where I'm at, and I didn't... You know, in this example, I didn't have to add all of it, but you can imagine that um, that might vary depending on the situation. But at least I knew what ballpark of, um, of the salt that I needed to add. And that's how you go about preparing a buffer. With those things in mind, I think you can now answer and, and work on some um, buffer problems. In step one, I want you to um, determine how to make a pH 4.5 buffer. So once again, you can immediately assume you're going to start working with a weak acid. And then out of that, I want you to be able to answer these three questions. If you have the buffer system built already, how much sodium hydroxide could you uh, neutralize it? In other words, what's the capacity? The second question is, if you had the buffer starting with this again, you know, 300 mils of it, how much acid could you neutralize? And then finally, a, a more practical calculation is, you know, these two questions are really just to give you a feel. Do you understand the capacity of the total capacity of your system once you get it built? And then C is now what if you added, you have the buffer system made, you have the 300 mils, and now you added a small amount of acid, what's it gonna, the new pH going to be? And this is a good practice on your calculations. And then finally, the last question is, I didn't do this in my example, but what if you were on the other side of things, you're needing to make a pH 10.6 buffer. And so in order to do that, you need to ch check from the basis. That's going to take a couple steps, and it's a good review to get you back through your acid-base theory. And remember, if the pH is 10.6, you can work back to the pOH, which will really key you into your KB that you're trying to target. So with that in mind, 
why don't you stop your video, um, get out some paper and pencil and a calculator, try and work these problems, choose the appropriate material, um, answer the questions, and then when you're uh, done working on the practice, restart the video and check your answers. All right, so let's see how you did. We're going to start with this, making uh, 300 mils. It's a one molar capacity buffer system, which has a pH of 4.5. Um, you go back to your table, um, and, and basically that table was laid out in KAs, so we got to take a pH back down to a, a KA. So if I unravel this, take the negative, raise it to the power of 10, I get something that has a Ka of close to 3.16 e to the minus 5. So I looked around on that table and I chose adipic acid. And it looks like, the, in this case, the K1 of adipic acid. All right, 3.8 times 10 to the minus 5th. So if I look at the formula of that, I get a molecular weight of 146 grams per mole. Um, I look it up online, I see that it does come in a solid form, so that's kind of nice. Kind of work it out, 300 milliliters in this case. Do my conversions using the molecular weight and the definition of molarity. I need to add 43.8 grams of adipic acid. So once again, 43.8 grams of adipic acid dissolved up to a total volume of 300 mils. That's our target here. And now the next question is, how much of the uh, sodium adip adipate do I need to add in order to um, the conjugate base? So we need to work this backwards here a little bit. In order to use the Henderson-Hasselbeck, I need to know the pKa, because that's what goes into the formula. So once again, I do the negative log of the Ka, and I get the pKa. I could plug that now into the formula. Target pH is 4.5, the pKa of the acid, plus the log of the conjugate base over the acid. And in this, this case, we've made a solution that's a 1.0 molar. We've already made that, so we know that uh, target. So now I just need to unravel this and figure out my conjugate base uh, concentration. Uh, do the math. I end up with 1.26 molar. So once again, I go online. The supplier sells a sodium form of this um, adipate. It has a molecular weight of 168 grams per mole. I go through the process of how much of this solid would I have to add, uh, 300 mils uh, solution in order to make it um, 1.26 molar. That's my target. So I unravel that. I get 63.5 grams of monosodium adipate. And that's basically what you're after. Now the next question is, once you've built this thing, how many mils of 2.5 uh, molar sodium hydroxide could 300 mils of the buffer system neutralize? So once again, if you look at the solution you made in the you know, henderson hasselbalk form, you can see that um, the basic part of that is actually on top, right? That's, that's the amount capacity that uh, this has for taking out an acid, but the, the acid form is on the bottom. So this is the capacity that we're dealing with. Very easy to just use the uh, neutralization reaction. Plug and chug and solve. You could neutralize 120 mils. But now, this is interesting because now you're thinking, but wait a second, this is a diprotic acid. And that's true. In the true um, buffering sense, you could, at most, take care of 120 mils before your buffer broke down and started changing pH drastically. So that's kind of one answer to this question. But the second answer to the question is, hey, what if I want to just totally neutralize sodium hydroxide? I don't really care about the resulting pH. Okay, in this case, you need to take into uh, account the subscripts and in our particular case, this is adipic acid. It has two protons uh, for every mole of the adipic acid. So you could just put that in, plug and chug, and you could actually neutralize 240 milliliters. But once again, um, and, and I'll, the, the point for tests and all that is different than the question I'm asking here. I'm just trying to give you some practical advice. 
When you do it for the first proton, that's where your buffer is still going to be working. That's the capacity of the buffer. When you do it for the second proton, you're basically totally extending the diprotic acid and using it to neutralize the base. So either one of these questions is correct. It depends what your situation is. So now we go to the next question. Now we're going to attack it with acid. All right, and we're and because of how we made this buffer, we only really are able to reprotonate the adipate anion, right? But in the uh, henderson hasselbalch equation, that's good. That factor we're looking at is actually the the top number now. We have the base. How does the base? Um, what's the base capacity in essence? So same thing. Plug and chug. You um, use the neutralization equation. You solve, you get a, a volume of 630 milliliters. Okay, so now here's a, uh, a little harder problem. What if I have this buffer system built? I got 300 mils sitting there, and now I just start to add acid, but I don't, I don't add it beyond its capacity. It's still well within its capacity. What would the new pH be? So can you do this kind of calculation? And this is, is awesome practice to um, remind you about how these things work. And the way to look at that is, is think about when I add HCl to this particular um, base, if I was to work it through with stoichiometry, I would say, oh, look, for every equ equivalent of acid that hits this conjugate base, right, I basically form weak acid back. So the point of having to look at this equilibrium is, re is remembering this. Whenever... Um, a strong acid hits your buffer system. Every mole of strong acid that hits the buffer is going to chew up one mole of um, the weak base and it's going to create one mole of the weak acid. So when you put that back into the henderson hasselbalch equation, you can kind of work it this way and take, here's the moles originally of the whole um, buffer system, the base component, and I'm going to lose, you know, moles times volume will give you the number of moles you lose. Now, a lot of you might look at this and say, well, wait a second, this, this should be in terms of liters. And that's true to see it more directly. But what you'll learn in past videos is that when I make that conversion back to liters, divide this side and this by a thousand, and then I get to the bottom and do the same, that conversion will cancel out. So, you know, as a shortcut, you can always... Um, just leave the volume in here in whatever volume you're using as long as you're consistent throughout the henderson hasselbalch equation. So with that in mind, the idea again is molarity times volume gives the number of moles. Here's the, the total moles of base that were present in the buffering system minus the total moles of base that went away due to the neutralization. And then on the bottom is the total moles of weak acid that were originally present plus the moles of weak acid that you gained. And when you replug that in, recalculate the new pH is 4.17. Still, once again, a, a buffer with very little change in pH. And, and always a quick check is if you're attacking a buffer system with an acid, then the pH should be dropping. If I was attacking it with a base, it should be rising. You do the similar calculations. Okay, the final question is, okay, how do you make a basic buffer? And so you go back to your table, which actually is laid out in Ka, so we have to do a little bit of adjustment. We're going to 10.6, which if you go to the POH, that's 3.4. And now if you'll... Um, change that back out to a, a matching KB, I would uh, raise that to the, the negative number to the power of 10, and I get 3.9 times uh, 10 to the minus 4. That is the KB I'm looking for in my table. Now, sometimes tables are laid out where everything is in, in pKa, um, even the conjugate bases, or the um, basically the weak bases are laid out in, in Ka's, and that sometimes speeds up the process for you. But anyway, with that in mind, we searched the table. I found ethylene to mean it has a Kb of 4.3 times 10 to the minus 4th, and that's great. That's well within the range of one pH unit. 
Uh, I look up ethylene diamine. It has molecular weight of 45 grams per mole, but when I go online, Aldridge only sells that in the gaseous form. Or it has a water solution, and that works out nice. Full amine is 70% by weight in water, and it has a density of 0.81 grams per mil. And this is a nice exercise because it gives you a chance to look at your percent by weight and your density calculations. So if I work that out, I'm going to, I'm going to, my goal, my target here in this calculation is I want to know the molarity of a 70% by weight ethylamine uh, in water solution if the density is 0.81 grams per mil. I work that out and say, well, if it's for, uh, to figure out molarity, I need to know how much in a, in a liter, right? So I take a thousand mils. I take it times the density. That'll tell me the grams I have in a thousand mils. Of those grams, 70% is from ethyl amine. So now I have the mass of ethyl amine in there. Convert that up to moles. And consequently, I've got a 12.6 molar ethyl amine solution when it's listed as 70% by weight. So now I can work off of the dilution equation. So I plug and chug into the dilution equation. I solve for the volume of the 12.6 molar ethyl amine uh, solution that I need to add. And I get 29.8 mils of this, of the 70% by weight ethyl amine. I add that, dilute it to a, a half liter volume. And now the next question is, how much then of the um, uh, conjugate acid do I need to add? So I got to work that back out according to the henderson hasselbalch equation. And to, in order to do that, I need to know the pKa. And if I work that back from Ka to Kb using the uh, Kw of water, then I change it back out to a, a pKa, I end up with 10.6. And those are, I showed you that on some previous videos. So I can now plug 10.6 in, and that's actually the target of pH that I'm looking for. And, and so that makes it kind of nice that ethylene diamine is actually spot on for the pH I was trying to acquire. So I know that when I do that, the um, concentration of conjugate base has to be equal to the conjug uh, conjugate acid in order to uh, make this log of 1, which is, uh, is 0. So I solve for that. I know I'm heading for a 0.75 molar concentration. Now this particular material, I can find the ethyl uh, ammonium chloride is actually a solid, so that's nice, a little easier to work with. I do my calculation according to a uh, half liter solution, a 0.750 moles per liter, that's the uh, definition of molarity there. On the molecular weight, I end up with 30.5 grams of ethyl ammonium chloride that I need to add to the solution. So, that can then be added by spoon, but once again, keep in mind that I'm not going to actually just dump it in there and hope for the best. I'm going to have my pH meter running, add it till I get to the right pH, and that way my buffer will be spot on for the pH I'm trying to acquire. So I hope this has help you understand buffers in particular, and we will continue on with one more um, video on acid and bases.